Hi, my name's Professor McGlade, and I want to talk today about can gender equality help tackle climate change? Around the world, we know that the world's poor are disproportionately affected by climate change and all the kind of disasters that go with that. But climate change affects women and men very differently. I mean, the trend is much more pronounced the stronger and the larger the impact of the disaster. Women, in particular, face vulnerabilities coming from cultural norms and the fact that often they're lower in the socioeconomic status in society. So women's domestic roles uh, often make them disproportionately users of natural resources, which puts them in harm's way when it comes to getting access to water, to firewood and forest products. And under climate conditions, that can be even more exacerbated. So as resources become scarcer, women experience a much more increased role and work burden. Um, and, in, and despite these vulnerabilities though, experienced by women and men, we see that they really can't voice these concerns. So this exclusion of women's voices, not only in development aspects, but also in policy, means that a whole range of extensive knowledge is really being missed. Now, women and men are not helpless when it comes to climate change. In fact, they have a, a great say. But the various methods and ways that we use to uh, set up policies often just shape themselves around the norms uh, established for males as opposed to for women. What is clear, however, is that when women are empowered and educated, they can make real decisions. So here, for example, in the Mao Forest in Kenya, we see that women spend up to a day going into the forest, gathering firewood, which is primarily for their own use, but also for sale. It's their source of livelihood. Together, over the, for, over the whole area of the Mao Forest, 400,000 households, um, this carries on. And within a year, we can see from an energy audit we've just concluded that they're extracting 2 million metric tons of wood. Now, that, only destroy, that not only destroys the forests and the climate resilience, but also it means that a lot of women are exposed to indoor air pollution at levels which is damaging their health. So altogether, this group, as a, in a sense that's disempowered, does not have its voice heard, is on the one hand undermining climate resilience and at the same time harming themselves. Now, you wouldn't think that uh, naming would have such a, an impact, but it turns out that as we go through um, all of these different areas, whether it's with the, the smog and sewage and flood and so forth, the one area that people stand up and speak about is in storms. And naming of storms turns out to be something really quite, um, uh, quite important because in the 1970s, a convention was established that storm naming would be first male, then female, then male, then female. So, for example, in 2019-20, the names goes through Atia, Brendan, Kiara, Dennis, Ellen, all the way through to Tara, Vince and Willow. And a study done in 2014 by Jung and some, uh, some colleagues, which was initially seen very skeptically by academics, showed that when a storm has a female name, people do not react um, so immediately. For example, evacuation plans are delayed. Uh, people sort of, there's a subjective prediction that a female storm is not as dangerous as a, as a male named storm and so on. So that the outcome is that storms, very large storms, for example, uh, have higher levels of mortality than those with, with male names. So, of course, one quick check is to start using non-gendered names for storms. That would already avoid many fatalities. The specificity of losses though, around um, uh, women particularly has been shown again and again. So we can see that uh, for Katrine, as here, it had a far higher impact on women than on men. Now, come to a big ev event like a, an earthquake. Okay, this is in part a sort of proxy for what will happen in climate change. We can see that the consequences are devastating. So the 2015 Nepali earthquake, 7.8 on the Richter scale, it even moved Mount Everest uh, an inch, brought uh, the capital to its knees. 9,000 people were killed, 22,000 people were injured, 800,000 buildings were flattened. But the issue here was that over a period of time, 
more and more of the men were working away so that when the earthquake happened and the subsequent floods and so forth and the aftershocks, the majority of the people on the ground were women. Now, they eventually um, sort of stepped in, took over many of the traditional roles of men in terms of building, construction. They did humanitarian work and so on and so forth. What was happening in Nepali society, of course, has now speeded up. But essentially what you saw was that a lot of the women had children to look after, elderly to look after. And they were also, because of the men leaving the country to do other jobs, were totally responsible for agricultural production. And that whole uh, sort of machinery of the informal sector and agriculture effectively collapsed during the during and after the earthquake. And so as a result, there was no one else to pick it up. And that's when the food losses and the loss of uh, livestock really happened with great, great uh, impact. So overall, um, the, the sort of the, the, this is an extreme case of what can happen, that women put into the forefront, step in and take over these roles. But then many other things that they have been doing, perhaps in an invisible way, are really not taken into account. Then think about um, a more kind of graphic picture of this. We can turn to Katrina. Now, the, the sort of the statistics are really up against us because across the world, disasters happen. And we can see that the impact on women compared to men can be one and a half, sometimes even four times greater on women than on men. And so why, why is this? Well, often women are in the lowest and they are the poorest. They're in the lowest socioeconomic um, uh, level. They're often unable to escape or flee. Maybe they don't have a car. They haven't got a way to get out. They depend on public transport. It's one of the first things to go. When they enter into a particular housing, they're often in poor housing areas. They're often responsible for children. Uh, they're often responsible for elderly people. So their mobility is far, far more constrained. And for example, when um, you look at some of the populations, like in Louisiana or in the case of uh, New Orleans, then the vast proportion of people who are elderly and then in hospitals are women. So at a moment of disaster, it is very clear that women are in harm's way. Unfortunately, they're also in the line of gender-based um, uh, violence. And so we can see during the course of events like Katrina and others that this kind of violence escalates. For example, during Katrina um, in Mississippi, the level of incidents went from four in 100,000 to 16 in 100,000. Of course, it went down afterwards. But it was actually during the events that these things were happening. But in spite of this, women have continued uh, to be rebuilding homes, assuming new roles and so forth. But one of the, cru one of the crucial difficulties that we see is this issue of the silent voice and, and how to be heard. And we can see that the losses that women experience can be attributed to the fact that they maybe don't have identity cards. One of the problems in Nepal was that many of the women simply did not have any form of identification and therefore didn't qualify for development aid. In a groundbreaking book by a lady called Criado Perez, um, it was made clear that this invisibility has other repercussions. So, for example, here, the drought in Kenya, many, many people were lost. But it was anecdotal that the majority were, in fact, women because there were no statistics, there were no gender-based statistics. More importantly, without those statistics and without that evidence, it's extremely difficult to shape the way in which we can develop policies. So it could be that this lack of gender-specific data um, has sort of unintentionally created a world biased against women. The ways in which it, it, this happens could be that we think that there's more mobile phones than there, than there really are. The way in which mobile phones are used to list missing persons, for example, misses out the fact that women often don't have those phones um, and, and simply don't have access to tell people. This is really something that has been brought up again and again. And what we what we also see is that it's linked to land tenure. So around the world, the fact that um, a lot of women are not registered is because they are not landowners. And it's really still quite uh, amazing that 
nearly sort of, uh, well, less than 1% of land is owned by women in Saudi Arabia. It goes up to 51% in a country like Cabo Verde. But globally, we're talking about less than 13%. And this is actually seen to be a major issue because when we think about climate change and adaptation and mitigation, much of what we're going to do beyond the energy systems is how we're going to use land. Even creating biomass for energy requires land. And as we see in many countries, the social norms are not in favor of necessarily having women or their religious practices, for example, or norms that discriminate against women, especially in owning land. It means that a lot of that shift and transformation that we're looking for is very unlikely to happen unless we look at land tenure itself. So when we think about the causes of uh, also the downside of impacts and whether it's gender based or not, gender biased, then certainly it is. Now, what can we do? We can address issues such as access to water, access to fuel, access to energy. We can really address the issue of land based tenure. But fundamentally, what a lot of people have been thinking and talking about, and here we can see Mary Robinson, uh, former um, uh, president of, of Ireland, and then taking on her role as a commissioner in the UN, we can see that there's a conversation which has taken up through a kind of slightly different lens, which is feminist climate change. Now, whether or not you agree with the, with the feminist label, what it is certainly doing is bringing to the forefront the need that we need all the voices at the table. Climate change is not gender neutral. That's absolutely clear. It does affect women more than men. So it's no longer just a matter of climate change. It's about equality. And that equality comes down to much better decision making. So take, for example, a country like the Dominican Republic. It's amongst one of the 10 nations to be considered the most vulnerable to climate change. And yet it's in the lowest, it's in the, the, the it's the fourth most, um, the poorest country in the world. And yet it has decided to fundamentally change itself by making sure that all of its climate responses are gender based. In other words, they're taking a gender approach to disaster management and to climate change, looking at security and sexual security of women, looking at the water laws, looking at, for example, how diseases differentially affect women like dengue fever and, and Zika and chikungunya. So by taking that approach, they're really setting out what a difference it can make. And it is quite extraordinary how Taking that view has already had great benefits for many, many uh, populations, including the male side. So, yes, it's women led forestry activities, but that has improved the lives of everyone. So taking account of 50 percent or at least a large percentage of the population into decision making is already making a difference in some of these. Countries. And here we see some women in Benin who traditionally have been responsible for stewarding the forest and the forest in many cases where they are taken care of by women, are far, far more um, proactively used in climate mechanisms, both for mitigation, but also for adaptation. So we have precedents and we have ways in which we can see the benefits that this occurs. In Lamao, in my own place where I work, I'm beginning to see that the idea of disaggregating the world, in other words, looking at the striations as we see in the rocks and breaking down a simple picture into what lies beneath it is really begin to yield great benefits. So we've begun a program. It's a gender based program where we have gender equality and we bring men and women together and facilitate them to set up new businesses. And this week we've been um, finishing a program where instead of taking that firewood out, that two million metric tons a year, we're actually replacing it with biogas at the household level. So the ladies and the men are working together to create small cooperatives and business, which will give them jobs, avoid all the forest devastation. But more importantly, they've linked it now to what is happening in climate. And they've effectively become the spokesperson from the from the very local community level right the way up into government and to government policy. So I think we can make change happen, but we have to do it in a gender balanced way so that we don't leave half of our population behind and overexposed to the impacts of climate change. Thank you very much.